Welcome back. We've got some breaking news coming in from Kashmir. Unfortunate news this. Terrorists have fired upon a civilian named Satish Kumar Singh. This happened in Kulgam in Kashmir. Singh is a driver. He's critical. He's been shifted to hospital for the treatment. His condition is set to be in a dire state right now. This is the sixth targeted attack on civilians by terrorists since the beginning of this month. Mufti has more details. Mufti, do we have any idea of why this man was targeted? Mufti, if you can hear me, do we have any information on why Satish Kumar Singh was targeted? All right, he's not responding. We'll try and go back to Mufti in just a second. But the preliminary information that we have is that this is the sixth attack since the beginning of April on a Kashmiri Hindu. Uh, let me go across uh, back to Mufti. Mufti, any idea on why uh, this gentleman was attacked? Well, we've seen since October a lot of uh, these attacks taking place on labors, on Kashmiri pundits, on other minority members. And it seems that it was stopped. Uh, but again, it started picking up from April. April 2 is when uh, these attacks start. And this is today the sixth attack that one has seen in the last 11 days. And clearly, yet again, uh, a Kashmiri Hindu now chosen. Kashmiri Hindus are different than Kashmiri pundits because he happens to be a non-migrant Rajput. And that's what we're picking up. He's been uh, given a shot uh, in the upper part of the body, which means that he will be critical. He's right now in the hospital where doctors, I spoke to a while back, said he's extremely critical and might not perhaps survive. But all said and done, uh, what is happening since last, uh, you know, 11 days is that, again, those targeting, targeted killings, uh, rather injuries, have rather, rather started to pick up. And right. we've seen that, although few days back, uh, most of these people were shot uh, to injure themselves, but this seems to be a fatal incident. And again, it seems that militants have again started to target this. In fact, the Kashmir Freedom Fighters One group has claimed responsibility, saying that, well, we're going to continue with that because right. we don't want Kashmiri Hindus to settle out in the valley. Okay, Mufti, we'll leave it at that. Uh, uh, dustedly indeed. And there seems to be a pattern of Kashmiri Hindus being targeted over the last few days. Meanwhile, it's been 50 days almost since uh, Vladimir Putin launched his invasion on Ukraine. Most of Ukraine has been reduced to rubble. Mass graves have been found in Bucha. The fear is that other cities like Mariupol could see the same fate. Heavy fighting continues in most areas. Over 10 million Ukrainians have been displaced. Four and a half million have fled the country. There's been talk of chemical weapons being used, large-scale war crimes being committed. Vladimir Putin has said that peace talks are at a dead end. No one thought that Putin would follow through on the threat of invading Ukraine, except the guest who's joining me right now, political scientist and uh, distinguished professor of political science at the University of Chicago, Professor John Mearsheimer. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mo John Mearsheimer, for speaking with us here on CNN News 18. It's going to be 50 days in this war. Uh, what is your assessment of how far it's come, what Putin's motivations were when he launched this war, and whether he's managed to achieve any of it? My view all along has been that this crisis, which now is an actual war, is all about the West's efforts to make Ukraine a Western bulwark on Russia's borders. Uh, it all started back in April 2008 at the NATO summit in Bucharest, where NATO announced that Ukraine and Georgia would become members of NATO at some point. The Russians, and Putin in particular, made it unequivocally clear at that time that this was crossing a red line. This was unacceptable. This represented an existential threat to mm -hmm. Russia. They made that very clear. Uh, the crisis broke out on February 22nd, 2014, and the West responded by doubling down. And when President Biden moved into the White House mm -hmm. in January of 2021, he went further than the Trump administration did in backing Ukraine. And we, in effect, were crossing a red line. We were presenting an existential threat to the Russians. And the Russians made this unequivocally clear to us, and we continued to double down. And the end result is on February 24th of this year, Putin invaded Ukraine. Now, so far, the, the world has been looking at this war as some kind of a limited conflict. That's what we saw in Crimea. That's what we saw in Georgia a few years ago. 
But now we're going to enter the third month of this war. And Russia has threatened to use tactical nuclear weapons. We've seen hypersonic missiles being used. Where, according to you, is that red line which, if crossed, the West and NATO in particular will have no choice but to intervene directly? Well, it's hard to say definitively where the red line is, but it's very clear that if the Ukrainian military does very well against the Russian military in the upcoming offensive that the Russians are going to launch in eastern Ukraine, and the Russian forces are really being clobbered by all these Ukrainian drones and uh, javelin missiles and so forth and so on, and that all this Western intelligence that's being provided to the Ukrainians is a huge force multiplier. If the Russian military begins to fall apart, uh, I think you're then going to be in a very dangerous situation. And if at the same time, the Russian economy is really beginning to hurt and is even on the verge of collapsing, I think at that point, the Russians will think very seriously about trying to rescue the situation with nuclear weapons. Uh, again, I'm not saying that's likely, but uh, I believe the West is playing with fire here. There are reports, uh, Professor Mearsheimer, uh, that Putin is getting impatient. He didn't expect this war to go on for this long. Therefore, he's now reassessing his objectives, redirecting his troops. He's now going to focus uh, on eastern Ukraine to try and, quote, unquote, liberate the Donbass. Uh, he's got a new general, a general who used to oversee operations in Syria. Uh, he's now been handed over charge. Uh, he's also reportedly been given a deadline of May the 9th to show some form of military victory by V-Day, which is Victory Day on May the 9th. Is that even possible? I don't think so. Uh, I think, first of all, the Russian army has not performed well at all. And it's hard to believe that that's going to change overnight just because they put a new general in charge. It, it could gradually change over a process of uh, months, but uh, I don't see uh, an overnight change. The other thing is, if the Russian military does well against the Ukrainians, the Americans will go to great lengths, as will the Europeans, West Europeans and East Europeans, to help the Ukrainians rescue the situation. You want to remember that we're in a situation here where the Russians feel that they can't lose. And the Americans and their European allies feel that they can't lose. It would be a humiliating defeat for the United States, and especially for President Biden, if we were to lose this war and Russia to, was to win a great victory. So we will go to great lengths to keep Ukraine fighting. You know, as I've often said, we're going to fight to the last Ukrainian. And the Russians are going to fight like crazy to make sure that they don't lose. So the question you have to ask yourself is, where does this all end? And to argue it's likely to end by May 9th, I don't think so. And in fact, there are a number of reasonable people in the United States and in Western Europe who are arguing that this war is likely to go on for years. Now, one of the fallouts of this war ha has been the coming together of China and Russia. Uh, they're calling it uh, a limitless partnership, as we saw Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin at the Winter Games just before this war began. What may be the long-term implications of these two countries coming together? Because even during the Cold War, one of the reasons why the U.S. was able to win it was because there was a wedge between China and the then Soviet Union. But now, if that's no longer the case, what implications may that have for the U.S.? For the United States... There is one serious threat in the world today, and it's China. It is not Russia. China is a peer competitor. It threatens to be a regional hegemon in Asia. The United States should be focusing laser-like on China. It should be working overtime to think about how to contain China. And at the same time, it should be working with Russia as an ally to help contain China. 
India, Russia, the United States should all be on the same side of the ledger, all bent on containing China, because China has the potential to be a remarkably powerful country. Instead, what the United States has foolishly done is it has picked a fight with Russia, it is bogged down in Eastern Europe, it has done remarkably little in Asia, especially in East Asia, to explain to its allies how it plans to contain China because it's too busy thinking about how to fight the Russians. And we shouldn't be fighting the Russians, we should be working to have some sort of alliance with the Russians, again, all for the purposes of containing China. But we're not doing that. This tells you very simply that there's one winner as a result of this Ukraine war, and that winner is China. So where does that leave countries like India, for example? We have our own problems with China, uh, and yet one thing that this war seems to have exposed is that India is not on the same page as the United States or Australia or Japan, uh, members of the Quad, uh, on how to deal with Russia and Ukraine. Joe Biden so much so has called India somewhat shaky. Do you see some kind of wedge uh, in India-U.S. ties because of this Russia-Ukraine war? I don't think uh, that American unhappiness with India, and, and there's no question the Biden administration is unhappy with India, as uh, President Biden made clear to Mr. Modi uh, yesterday. So we're unhappy, or the administration is unhappy, but it doesn't matter very much. Uh, the United States needs India. Uh, the United States has a rich history of having fundamental disagreements with India, and we've gotten used to that. Uh, but more importantly, we need India for purposes of containing China. So I, I don't think there's any serious danger of a rupture in relations uh, between the two countries. I think from India's point of view, it is not a good thing that the Americans are bogged down in Eastern Europe and have lost sight of the importance of the China threat, because India, the United States, and Russia, as I said before, should all be on the same page vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, we're in this rather bizarre situation where it makes no strategic sense for the United States to be trying to drive a wedge between India and Russia. If anything, we should be happy that they're working together. But we can't be because we are in this remarkably foolish war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and you want to remember, we're not doing any of the actual fighting now, but we are deeply involved. Uh, we're doing everything but the fighting. And uh, all of our sort of intellectual um, capital is being focused on Eastern Europe now. We're not thinking about how to deal with China. And again, okay. this is, uh, from our point of view, a terrible situation. But you never want to lose sight of the fact that it's Ukraine that is paying the greatest price here. This country is being destroyed. And I argued long ago that this is what would happen. Right? I'm not saying that this is justified. I'm just saying that this is what happens when you poke a great power like Russia in the eye and you present it with an existential threat. You do not want to underestimate how ruthless great powers can be. And this includes the United States of America as well as Russia when they think they're facing an existential threat. And again, Vladimir Putin thinks he's facing an existential threat. And in my opinion, that makes him very dangerous. All right. As always, Professor John Mearsheimer, thank you very much for your thoughts and your perspective. Pleasure indeed speaking with you. Thank you. All right. Russian troops may have withdrawn from the Ukrainian capital of Kiev, but they've left behind a trail of destruction. By artillery strikes. Vehicles lying in a mangled heap. And bodies burnt beyond recognition. This is all evidence of Russia's brutal occupation and the fierce fight by the Ukrainians to drive them out. Dozens of unexploded bombs lie around here, including cluster munition, which the Russians deny using. There are about 50 such elements in one bomb, he says. This is a high explosive fragmentation bomb to kill people, designed just to kill people. 
Russia's military may have been beaten in Kyiv, but they've caused unimaginable death and ruin. There are about 50 such elements in one bomb, he says. This is a high explosive fragmentation bomb to kill people, designed just to kill people. In a historic policy shift, Finland and Sweden are veering closer and closer to NATO. In fact, Sweden has said that it's going to apply to NATO membership within the next six months. Finland, too, is mulling membership of uh, NATO. Remember, these two countries have never historically been part of NATO. Finland, in fact, shares a thousand kilometer land border with Russia. For a long time, between the 18th and the 20th centuries, over 100 years, uh, Finland, in fact, was part of the Russian Imperial Empire. Uh, if Finland were to join, uh, NATO forces will literally be at Putin's door, much like the fear that he had of NATO troops in Ukraine. Russia and Sweden are not connected by a land border, but they are connected by sea. In fact, uh, just a few hundred kilometers, less than a few hundred kilometers uh, to get between Russia and Sweden. Putin has warned both Sweden and Finland that there will be political and military consequences if they join NATO. Meanwhile, uh, let's shift focus now. Infosys, one of the biggest IT firms, not just in India, but in the world, is moving its business out of Russia. It is pursuing alternate options, and it comes in the backdrop of the war on Ukraine. Several other global IT giants, Oracle, SAP, etc., have either suspended or simply paused all operations in Russia. Russia claims more than a thousand Ukrainian soldiers have surrendered in Mariupol, which is a strategic port city in eastern Ukraine uh, that's been surrounded by Russian troops for weeks now. If Mariupol falls to Russian hands, then Moscow will be able to better link its advancing troops from the east with those from the Crimean Peninsula. Meanwhile, newly released uh, satellite images show a Russian military convoy moving towards the Donbass region. Now, this is in keeping with the pull out from uh, Kiev and the move into the eastern part. The Russian troops are advancing from a place called Izium. Uh, this is right in the middle of the country. The plan is to capture the strategic city of Slovyansk. This is in the Donbass region. A further push uh, in the east would mean to take the entire Donbass. Remember, at the start of this war, Russia controlled only about a third of the Donbass region. They are basically trying to create a land bridge from Russia through the Donbass into occupied Crimea. Meanwhile, the alleged suicide of a contractor in Udupi in Karnataka has led to an FIR against Karnataka Minister K.S. Ishwarappa. The FIR accuses Ishwarappa of driving the contractor Santosh Patil to suicide. Our death not only yen bar diti dhane, our na arrest madhu ko. Our after aada basurajy Ramesh Antaro immediate arrest agbe ko. In his suicide note, the deceased contractor accused Ishwarappa of non-payment of his bills. ये जन्मदिन पूरा लाओ रिप्रो, अत्यंत बीजेपी के अधिकारी पर while Ishwarappa is denying any involvement and refusing to resign, Chief Minister Bombay is under pressure. Opposition Congress approached the governor and sought the dismissal of Ishwarappa. So is it only a matter of time before Ishwarappa goes? In fact, BJP sources have told CNN News 18 that the central leadership of the BJP is unhappy with this entire episode and they are likely to ask Ishwarappa to step down. A report has also been sought from the BJP Karnataka. Meanwhile, BJP Chief JP Nadda will be visiting Karnataka on the 16th of April. He will uh, help draw a roadmap for the party's strategy for next year's assembly elections. Last week, Chief Minister Basavaraj Bombay had flown down to Delhi to meet Nanda and other people. A government school teacher in Kanyakumari has been accused of trying to convert students to Christianity and forcing them to read the Bible. The teacher has been suspended, but this is the second big conversion case to Rock Tamarnad in the last few months. Earlier this year, a young girl died by suicide after being pressurized by the hostel warden. Two FIRs have been registered against senior Congress leader Digvijay Singh for sharing a misleading photograph claiming that it was related to the Khargon communal violence in Madhya Pradesh. Chief Minister Shivraj Singh Chauhan himself busted the fake news. Digvijay Singh has now filed a counter-complaint against Chauhan for tweeting a fake video of Rahul Gandhi. Uh, there was high drama in the Calcutta High Court today. 
The ruling Trinamool Congress's legal wing blocked the doors of the High Court and barred lawyers from entering the Court of Justice Abhijit Gangopadhyay. TMC's legal wing claimed Justice Gangopadhyay had committed a crime by passing orders in the school service corruption case. The trigger for the showdown is the High Court's directive to Bengal Minister Partho Chatterjee. He was asked to appear before the CBI in connection with irregularities in the appointment of assistant teachers in government schools. Justice Gangopadhyay had also given the CBI the liberty to arrest the minister. Meanwhile, just days after the rape and murder of a teenager in Hanskali in Bengal's Nadia district, the BJP has formed a five-member fact-finding committee to visit that place. Now, this comes a day after the Calcutta High Court transferred the case to the CBI to facilitate a fair investigation. Five properties belonging to arrested NCP leader Nawab Malik have been provisionally attached by the Enforcement Directorate. This has been done in connection with a money laundering case involving Malik and gangster Daud Ibrahim's sister, Hasina Bhatt. Two NCB officers investigating the Aryan Khan case have been suspended. The officers were suspended in connection with another case for not complying with rules and irresponsible behaviour. Meanwhile, Aryan will be making his directorial debut on a web series very soon. Days after the clashes in JNU over non-vegetarian food, the Ministry of Education has sought a formal report from the university. Two student groups clashed at the Kaveri Hostel on Sunday over the serving of non-vegetarian food on Ram Navmi Day. The JNU VC has now reacted on the issue, saying that there are no food restrictions on campus. JNU as a policy does not impose any food uh, choice on any student. It is your personal right and your fundamental right. You can eat what you want depending on where you come or what you want to. So this is very clear. The administration had no role in it. 23 students from four Noida schools have tested positive for COVID in the last three days. The affected schools have decided to stay shut as a precaution. The chief medical officer of Gautam Buddh Nagar, Dr. Sunil Kumar Sharma, has also said there's no reason to panic. The authority has set up testing camps and continues to do contact tracing. Prime Minister Modi virtually interacted with personnel of the Indian, Arm, Indian Air Force, the Army, the NDRF and the ITBP, all of whom had participated in rescue efforts in Deogar in Charkhand. He thanked them for their service and said that lessons have been learned from the accident. Dozens were left stranded for more than 48 hours after two cable cars collided. You have been in three days एक मुश्किल रेस्क्यू ऑपरेशन को पूरा किया और अनेक देशवासियों की जान बचाई है पूरे देश ने आपके साहस को सराहा है As Sri Lanka faces its worst economic crisis ever demonstrations continue to rock the island nation protesting citizens are demanding the resignation of president Gotabaya Rajapaksha Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksha, his brother, has offered to hold talks with the protesters, but the opposition is threatened to bring in a no-confidence motion against the government. Shortage of all essential commodities, be it fuel, petrol, uh, uh, medicines especially, and uh, the Sri Lankan Medical Association has in fact urged countries like India to come forward. They have released a list of the medicines that, are, uh, that, uh, that they don't have. They have the credits from India, but that will only last till uh, prices are skyrocketing on the one side and there's acute shortage of uh, essential commodities and nothing has changed on... A masked gunman fired off 33 rounds on the New York subway, hitting at least 10 people, 7 men and 3 women. Five of these victims were students who were commuting to school. The NYPD has identified 62-year-old Frank James as a person of interest. A handgun and four grenades were recovered from a hall linked to the attack. This is a viral video from Jaisalmer in Rajasthan. Five people fell into a drain after a concrete cover caved in under their weight. CCTV footage shows four men chatting while one person is repairing a bike right next to them. Suddenly, the concrete cover caves in and all five men fall into the drain. In Ukraine's Mikhailakova village in the Donetsk Oblast, rescuers pulled out a puppy from under the rubble of a house that was damaged in Russian shelling. The scared pup, but miraculously unhurt, was reunited with its 77-year-old owner who survived the shelling as well. And finally, Ranbir Kapoor and Alia Bhatt's wedding festivities have kicked off officially in Mumbai. The Mehendi ceremony was held this afternoon at Ranbir Kapoor's Bandra apartment. While neither he nor his bride-to-be Alia Bhatt was spotted by the paparazzi, 
the couple's family and close friends made a beeline. One of the first people to arrive was Ranbir's mother, Neetu Kapoor. She was accompanied by daughter, Ridhima. Soon, the actor's cousins, Karina and Karishma Kapoor, turned up. Alia's filmmaker father, Mahesh Bhatt, and stepsister, Pooja Bhatt, were spotted driving into the house. The Kapoor and Bhatt Khandan aside, some of the biggest names in Bollywood also attended the ceremony. Filmmaker Karan Johar arrived in style for the Mehendi. Brahmashtra director Ayan Mukherjee was also present. It was on his movie sets that the Ralia love story began. Ranbir Kapoor and Alia Bhatt are expected to tie the knot in an intimate ceremony tomorrow.